My next guest in the author studio is one of the most engaging and talented personalities in the crime and thriller writing field. Meet the great Simon Toyne. When I was starting to write, I tried to find all kinds of writing tips and I just confused myself. So now when anyone asks me about writing tips, I always say ignore them, really. Try and ignore them uh, because really you're going to figure it out yourself. The best way to learn how to write a novel is to sit down and do it and you'll do it wrong. And that actually is right. Oh man, no, this is, no, that's like saying, you know, that's like Sophie's choice for authors. Um, uh, a problem, do you know, well, the first one, or with Sanctus, my first one, has always got a little special moment in your heart, I suppose. But actually, uh, Solomon Creed, which was the uh, sort of a new series that I wrote, which so it came out last year, because I wrote it differently to the others, I didn't plot it, and I normally I plotted, and so actually uh, it was really hard, but I think the results were better for not planning it all beforehand, so that one, I would say. Uh, well, I have three children, and so um, I use them as a bit of a timing device in that I drop them off at school, run back home, and I've got an office in the basement uh, with no Wi-Fi and almost, n well, no phone signal either. So I lock myself away and do as much as humanly possible before they come home and knock on the door and disrupt things. When I first started um, reading, um, Probably about the first, what I would say was a grown-up book I read, was I burned through my dad's uh, collection of Len Dayton and uh, Alistair MacLean, which I just loved. I thought they were great because they were, they were grown-up books, but they were exciting. Because it seemed to me lots of grown-up books, nothing happened. Whereas kids' books, everything happens. And these sort of did the same. Um, so I would say, yeah, those. Len Dayton Bomber, actually, is, is still, I think, is a work of genius that's much overlooked. Well, I don't really believe in guilty pleasures unless you're, as long as you're not breaking the law or hurting anyone. But um, I would say a kind of slightly embarrassing thing that I do is I listen to... My wife would say I have terrible taste in music. I, of course, would say I have fantastic, eclectic taste in music. Uh, but I, I am fond of a show tune. I do... I, I, I listen to music all the time when I'm writing, and I do like to listen... I sing along to lots of stuff. I'm infecting my children with it. We're currently listening to Les, Les Miserables. My son really likes the Javert songs, which I take as a good sign. Not really, other than putting it off. Um, starting's hard, and I think I, everyone does. You sort of put it off and you know, try and kind of clear the decks. Uh, actually, when, um, for my first three books, I did have a ritual that I've stopped doing, uh, and that was um, going back to my thing of saying no writing tips, is I figured that the best way to learn how to write a book was read books that were brilliant, that you thought were brilliant. And so I reread a bunch that I thought were suitable to the book, and one of which was Silence of the Lambs, which is, I think, still the kind of masterpiece, that's the blueprint of modern thrillers. Um, and then, the f and so I read, read it before I started writing, and then that book got sold and was very successful and launched my career. And so slightly superstitiously, before I wrote the next two books, which were part of a trilogy, I reread The Silence of the Lambs before I started, just to sort of show me where the bar was. Um, but then with Solomon Creed, I stopped. I, I didn't do it, and I haven't done it since. Well, going back, to Solomon Creed, I didn't really plan. So the first three I did, because I come from TV, and you plan everything. And so for the first three books, I wrote these very detailed point-by-point um, -point breakdowns of the plot and side notes of characters. And then for Solomon, um, he's this kind of huge, unknowable character, and I found I was writing enormous amounts of notes trying to get a grip on him. And so in the end, I decided that the best thing to do was write it and have him talk to me, which meant I had ended up with an enormous first draft that I needed to cut loads out of. Um, and now I kind of think I do a bit of both. So I, it's, I, I have a bit of planning and where I sort of know big, big beats of structure, and then I figure it out as I go along. No, not really. Um, I always, I think, wanted to tell stories. I always liked storytelling. Um, I'm a kind of failed film director, I suppose. I, I, was, I worked in um, television for 20 years, um, making a variety of good and also not so good programs. Um, and I always really wanted to be a film director. And actually, I remember reading a book um, written by John Irving um, about his experiences of adapting his own book, Cider House Rules. And he said that whenever he wants to direct a film, he writes a book. 
and I could see the wisdom in that because you do everything. You know, you, you, it's the plot, you cast it, you do the locations. So I thought that's what a failed film director should do is write a novel. So I did. Thankfully, no. Uh, I'm slightly OCD about backing everything up. Um, in the olden times, I used to email it to myself every day so that I had a copy floating in the ether in case the house burnt down. Um, now with iCloud, you back it or it just backs up automatically. I had one terrifying moment uh, once. Um, when you get to the end of a book, um, you get um, your notes back from the editor in a Word document, track changed. Now, track changes are great if you're working on a legal document of about 30 odd hundred pages. If you're working on a 500 page, 100,000 plus word novel, the, it, the, the software gets a bit creaky. And I remember once, it was really late, I had to deliver it. I'd spent days going through these things, track, checking the track changes. And I was literally, I think, on the last page. And I accidentally, instead of pressing um, Apple Z to undo something, I, pre pre I, for some reason I was tired, pressed Control A, which selected the entire document. And then I panicked and tried to press Control Z to undo it and hit Z. And then what happened, there was a pause and the little wheel went round and the entire document vanished and all that was left was a Z. And I kind of had this kind of moment of just, you know, sort of, it's like that thing in Jaws where he sees the shark, this sort of, that happened. And I was like, oh my God, that's nine months work, just got, you know, not thinking rationally. And then I did Control Z and, and the little wheel went round for about the longest minute of my life and then it all came back again. But yeah, it's, it is, I think it's every, I have anxiety dreams about losing work. I don't think there's any questions I hate being asked. I mean, generally, if, if someone's asking you a question, it means they're in, engaged in your work to some degree, which is you know, a privilege as an author. It annoys me slightly if um, I'm on a panel or something and um, someone says something fantastically interesting, like, oh yeah, you know, I grew up in a cult. And, and, and the person, the, the, the moderator has got their list of questions and goes, hmm, interesting. So where'd you get your ideas for it? You know, and just totally doesn't listen. That drives me nuts. It's like, no, let's hear about the cult. I'm not interested where the ideas come from. But, but no, I, there's no questions I, I hate being asked. I hope you picked out something from the great Simon Toyin and stay tuned.